Okay, so uh, thank you uh, very much, Stephen, for the introduction. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, we have uh, co-authored a couple of papers. We have been in email exchanges for the last four or five years, but we haven't actually met. So it's pretty exciting to me to meet one of my co-authors for uh, a long time. And um, it's very exciting to be here at uh, University of Michigan. <coughs> I've been here a couple of times, and the last time that I was here, I went to the um, other building that I learned today that it's basically vacated, and now you moved into this super fancy new building, this exciting room. Uh, too bad that my talk is not going to be super active learning, but uh, you can sort of talk to each other if you want to. And I just want to um, start by uh, mentioning what uh, Stephen just uh, referred to, that it's that I have been doing uh, quite a bit of uh, phylogenetic uh, research and phylogenetic analysis, doing sort of classic uh, phylogenetics, starting with Sanger sequencing, moving into phylogenomic analysis, moving into transcriptomics, uh, genomics, and more recently, we are starting to do some uh, functional genomic work. But today, I'm going to be uh, going back to my early times as a, a empirical uh, phylogeneticist and empirical systematist and describe some of the work that I started some years ago that I have been pushing uh, forward now in my lab <coughs> on uh, standard phylogenetics and sort of uh, more classic systematics uh, of a group of plants uh, in, uh, in different hotspots. So I recently started my lab at UCLA, and basically the, the, the motivation behind all my research has been always an interest in uh, plant diversity. So my, my group and myself included, we are fascinated by uh, species diversity, uh, by angiosperms in particular, and we are interested not only in species diversity, but also in the different ecologies and morphologies that plants display. And one of the main questions is, how did this happen? Why some clades are more diverse? Why some geographic regions show more species than other ones? And what are the mechanisms that explain species diversity, but also phenotypic and ecological diversity? So basically, in my lab, we ask questions ranging from uh, sort of classic taxonomy from species delimitations, species discovery, we have been doing some work on methods for species delimitations. Um, we reconstruct a demographic and evolutionary history of lineages using molecular data to ask questions about processes of diversification, process of speciation, and uh, radiation of, of major clades. And we also use these phylogenies to ask and answer questions on uh, how phenotypes evolve uh, how the relationship of phenotypes to diversification uh, relates, and some of these phenotypes could be from anatomical phenotypes all the way to transcriptomes, which is another type of phenotype. So in my lab, we integrate these type of approaches in what I called sort of an integrative view of uh, systematics. And today I'm gonna be uh, emphasizing some of the work that we have been doing, doing particularly in those of, uh, uh, the, uh, two of these areas, uh, more of the taxonomic work and the phylogenetic work. And we're starting to do some comparative analysis, um, but I'm not going to uh, present any of this right now. <clears throat> so uh, today I'm going to be talking about a particular plant system, which is uh, a genus called Escalonia in the angiosperms. I'm going to be describing a little bit more in a few seconds, uh, describe the context of where these plants occur, and I'm going to be addressing two main questions, like what are the uh, evolutionary patterns and processes that we can infer for the diversification in these plants in hotspots, and what species really are, and how that relates to our understanding of uh, diversification. So um, as we know, plant biodiversity or biodiversity in general, general is not uh, distributed uh, equally across uh, the globe. And there are some places on Earth that have higher concentrations of unique um, uh, plant species. Uh, and these are uh, commonly called as biodiversity hotspots. This is a map of the biodiversity hotspots that include high richness and high endemicity. And the question is, why these places have a very unique um, species, flora and fauna, and what are the processes driving the diversification of species in these regions. So I have been uh, doing some research in three of these biodiversity hotspots in South America, the tropical Andes, the Chilean or southern temperate Andes, and the mountains in uh, southeastern Brazil. Uh, so if one is interested in studying uh, the processes driving the diversification of plants or organisms in these regions, ideally one should study a group of plants or a group of organisms that is widely distributed across these geographic regions. Uh, and one of these examples is the plant genus Escalonia. So Escalonia is a group of about 40 species of uh, trees and shrubs, widely distributed from northern uh, Colombia and Venezuela with uh, one population in Costa Rica, in the highlands of Costa Rica, uh, all the way to Patagonia in Tierra del Fuego, um, and also with species 
in uh, the mountains in Brazil. These species range uh, also in elevation, as I'll show in a second, from some species being in the lower elevation of the Andes all the way to the highest peaks, uh, almost to the snow line. So because uh, perhaps not all of you are plant systematists, uh, let me give you a quick overview of where Scalonia is placed among the phylogeny of angiosperms. So Scalonia, this is a phylogeny of uh, plants put together a few years ago by Norman Wicked and uh, many collaborators using a bunch of data sets. And this is a, a quick uh, overview of the phylogeny where we have, I have indicated with icons sort of the, the plants for you uh, to, for, to guide you. So we have uh, the green algae, uh, sort of at the base of the tree, then we have the bryophytes, the lycophytes, the monilophytes, the gymnosperms, that pine tree, and then the angiosperms, and we have a, a, a palm tree indicating the monocots, and then the two major clades of the eudicots. And uh, that clade in green, uh, I have a sunflower indicating that clade is called the campanulites, and that's where Scalonia is. So this is a clade of uh, about 110 uh, million years old, but you know, dates are really, uh, difficult to estimate, but about that age. So if we zoom in in this clade, the, camp uh, the campanulites is a clade that includes very common plants, such as the sunflowers and their relatives, the carrots and relatives, the holly and their relatives, and the honeysuckles and relatives, and that's part of uh, the work that uh, Stephen has been doing in honeysuckles uh, at least uh, uh, some time ago. So Scalonia is a member of this clade, and that's uh, indicated in that green triangle uh, called the uh, Order Scalonialis. And I just want to zoom in here to make a couple of points. The first point is that, um, as you can see, the relationships uh, of all these genera within the Scalonialis, which is also the family Scaloniaceae, uh, it's relatively uh, unresolved, uh, very low support. These are booster values. So even though the family or the whole clade is highly supported, we have relatively uh, weak support uh, inside of the, the, the family, except the relationships between Valdivia, Forgesia, and Scalonia. And also, as you can see, sort of outside of the, of the family uh, of the clade, the relationships of this clade as, um, uh, in relation to other members of the campanulites is also relatively uh, low supported. So we have that 46, 89. So there has been always uh, a question about the relationship of this uh, clade among all the uh, campanulites. So some of the work that we started to do a couple of um, months ago we were doing some sequencing, and of course, some high throughput sequencing, the chloroplast basically came for free. So we ended up assign, uh, assembling um, many chloroplast genomes for uh, different members of the uh, Scalonialis in green, but all members of the campanulites. This is uh, work led by, my, uh, by Claudia Enriquez. She's a researcher in my lab. But unfortunately, even with full chloroplast genomes, we are getting very low support, very low resolution to these, node, these nodes. This perhaps is not a surprise. The gene, the chloroplast genes have a lot of mixed signal. Some genes evolve really fast. Some genes evolve really slowly. And it seems that part of these incongruences um, may be driven by these uh, different rates in uh, rate heterogeneity that perhaps might relate to some of the work that also Stephen uh, did a few years ago showing how woody plants and herbaceous plants seem to show different rates of, 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 uh, of evolution. And this clade is extremely variable. So we find here very tiny little herbaceous things all the way to huge trees, and potentially that's what it's driving. But I'm not gonna be uh, emphasizing this work. I just wanna go back to Scalonia. So Scalonia, uh, as I described, is, a, is widely distributed throughout the mountains. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples to sort of uh, introduce you to the amazing diversity that this group displays. So as I mentioned, some species occur in the temperate forest of Southern South America, like in Chile and Argentina, where these plants are small trees and shrubs in the understory of uh, uh, forest dominated by the oaks of the South, the genus Notophagus in the Notophagaceae. Uh, that's the, the picture uh, on the top left. Then we have in the Patagonian grasslands, uh, almost at, basically at sea level, uh, we have uh, uh, shrubby plants such as this uh, Escalonia here in, in Tierra del Fuego. If we move into Brazil, uh, species occur throughout the elevational range in Brazil from a lo low elevation all the way to the highest peaks in what is called the Campos Rupestres or the really uh, highlands of, of Brazil. Some species have colonized and diversified the central part of Chile, which uh, has a climate very similar to uh, the Mediterranean climate or, or California. Uh, where there's a very um, dry summer and a lot of rain in the winter, and there's many species that have colonized these environments. If we move into the tropical Andes, we find species in the low elevation, tropical uh, inter-Andean dry forest, such as this species on the left that has 
uh, is deciduous, so you see a picture on the, in the dry season on top and the wet season below. Uh, it, it loses the leaves, and there are a couple of species that have diversified these regions. If we move a little bit higher in elevation, we get to the tropical cloud forest, where there are many species, well, at least like six or seven species that have diversified in this super uh, lush and, and wet environment. And we go to the highest peaks in the Andes, in the tropical Andes, we get to the Paramos, where very few Uri angiosperms have uh, colonized and diversified. And Escalonia is one of these uh, plants that you, uh, in this picture, what you see is a grassland with some crazy asteraceae, but the dark green that you see in the background is these little shrubby things that are uh, in the family, in the genus Escalonia. In terms of uh, phenotypic diversity, Escalonia also displays a wide range of um, variation in flower and uh, leaf phenotypes. So flowers can be um, single, can be inflorescences with few to many, many flowers. The type of inflorescences also changes. There are open, open inflorescences, pendular inflorescences, erect inflorescences. The flowers are usually uh, kind of closed, even though they are not fused. The petals are sort of closed, as you see in most of these pictures. But a few species, the petals are completely open. And as you can see also, there is quite a bit of leaf variation in leaf size, leaf shape, uh, leaf thickness, and so on and so forth. So I hope that you have uh, uh, been convinced already that Scalonia is a really interesting system to study uh, diversification in mountain ranges because of its wide latitudinal range from northern Venezuela to southern Argentina and Brazil, but also its wide ecological and phenotypic variation in leaf, uh, flower, uh, phenotypes. So uh, the first step uh, was to uh, construct, uh, reconstruct the phylogeny of Scalonia to try to understand the process of diversification. So uh, this is uh, some uh, old data that uh, where all of this started a few years ago, where I built the phylogeny of Escalonia using multiple genes. And I'm going to show today only two markers from the nuclear genome, but I also did with chloroplasts and different markers. And all of these genes basically support the same relationships. Uh, and the uh, main idea here is that the phylogeny of Escalonia can be summarized into five main clades, where these five main clades were consistent and concordant between the different markers that I found. But relationships within clades were not consistent or concordant between the different markers. However, the species were always restricted to these five main clades. Uh, some of the current work that we are doing right now in my lab, uh, led by uh, my new postdoc, uh, Sarah Jacobs, has been uh, trying to uh, build this phylogenetic Escalonia again, but with more data, trying to, to increase our gene sampling. And we have been using uh, rat seek data. This is a, a three rat phylogeny. Uh, with way more uh, SNPs, as you can tell, uh, the same number of individuals. And broadly, what we are finding is, again, these five clades uh, that are highly supported. And we are starting to recover um, the, the relationships within clades with a much better resolution. <clears throat> so with these phylogenies in hand, I decided to, I was interested in asking questions about potential mechanisms of diversification in mountain ranges. So I contrasted and I tested two different hypotheses because this has been proposed as main drivers or important drivers of diversification of plants uh, in mountain ranges. On the one hand, people have suggested that topographic heterogeneity promotes geographic isolation and thus increases the opportunity for allopatric speciation. So basically, geography is the main driver of, uh, of speciation. In contrast, some people have suggested that perhaps environmental gradients along elevational, uh, environmental uh, changes along elevational gradients promote adaptation to different ecological conditions when you go up or down the mountains, increasing the opportunities for adaptation and likely uh, uh, ecological speciation, or speciation driven by these environmental and ecological conditions. So to test this hypothesis, I um, decided to do the following. So we know that um, geography and environment are not independent and they co-vary in very different ways. So I'm gonna give you a very simplistic uh, representation on the ways in which these two factors interact and the type of phylogenetic patterns that we can recover to test this hypothesis. So in the first scenario, what I have here is two mountain ranges uh, separated by a, by a valley, by a low elevation valley, where we have two environments in blue and red. And what you see here is how closely related species in the black triangles um, are, is this a pointer? Anyway, so how the black triangles represent the closely related species are restricted to the same environmental conditions but these environments occur across geographic regions, in different geographic regions. So this is, uh, has been uh, commonly called as the hypothesis of niche conservatism. And under this hypothesis, what we can predict is that phylogenetic distance increases with environmental distance and decreases 
with uh, geographic distance. Because if you have closely related species, for example, sort of low in the, in the y-axis, they occur in environments that are very similar, but these environments can occur far geographically. So under this hypothesis, what we can infer is that recent speciation events have been largely allopatric, induced by this niche conservatism. In contrast, what we can find is a pattern where closely related species are restricted to geographic regions, but they have diversified across elevational gradients. This uh, hypothesis has been uh, called the hypothesis of uh, niche evolution. So under this hypothesis, what we can predict is that phylogenetic distance increases with geographic distance, but decreases with environmental distance. Once again, because, for example, closely related species could occur in the same geographic region, so they are sort of uh, in the green line, but across environmental gradients, so across different uh, environments. So in this case, what we can infer is that uh, likely recent speciation events have been induced, uh, have been e ecological or ecological speciation events induced by this niche evolution across environmental gradients. So to test this hypothesis, I have been, I conducted first some uh, analysis of uh, sort of the geographic structure of the phylogenies, and uh, the results were uh, very strong. So the first result is that um, the phylogeny of Escalonia is highly uh, geographically structured, meaning that clades are restricted to, to geographic regions. As you can see here, with numbers and colors, so we have uh, clades one and two are plants restricted to the tropical Andes. Clade three in green is also restricted to the tropical Andes. Clade four is all the species restricted to the southern Andes in, in Argentina and Chile. And clade five includes all the species restricted to the mountains in Brazil with a few uh, species that apparently have colonized the Andes uh, in the tropics and also in the temperate regions. The directionality of this movement, the movement uh, is not clear um, because um, I didn't have uh, enough resolution at the time. Um, so what this um, pattern uh, suggests, this strong pattern of phylogenetic geographic structure, what it indicates is that geography seemed to have played a key role early in the history of the Escalonia by isolating lineages to distinct geographic regions where these species have been diversifying in complete isolation, perhaps with the exception of that clade five where there has been some migration between geographic regions. But for the most part, what we have is clades in regions where they diversify across these environmental gradients. So how does this relate to our hypothesis of niche evolution and niche conservatism? So to test this hypothesis, I run some uh, phylogenetic mantle tests, what, uh, and this is what you see in this uh, figure. So what you have in the x-axis is uh, geographic distance, in the y-axis, phylogenetic distance, um, and the gray dots, or the gray points, correspond to all the pairwise comparisons among all the terminals uh, in these phylogenies, and the color ones correspond to all the pairwise comparisons uh, within clades. And what you can clearly see is that uh, the uh, uh, regression analysis, the black line corresponds to the regression across the phylogeny, but also uh, some of the uh, regression points uh, were supported for within clades. So because geographic distance uh, is tightly correlated with phylogenetic distance, this uh, suggests that there has been uh, some niche evolution. So to test the uh, hypothesis about uh, the role of, geog of uh, environmental variation uh, structuring the phylogeny of Escalonia, I ask whether variance in bioclimatic variables was associated to the topology of the tree and to which nodes uh, most of this variance was associated with, or basically which nodes explain most of the variance uh, in these bioclimatic variables. So for this analysis, I use four bioclimatic variables, here indicated in uh, colors, the maximum temperature in the warmest month, the minimum temperature in the coldest month, the precipitation in the driest month, and the precipitation in the wettest quarter because these four climatic variables explain uh, a, a, um, a broad um, uh, aspect of uh, the bioclimatic niche of these plants, but also these four climatic variables are very um, um, strong indicators or strong um, uh, forces for plant functioning and plant survival. So they seem to be critical for, 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 for plant physiology. So to do this analysis, I basically uh, ask, I uh, use a method that basically I asked two things. One. Is the variance in these bioclimatic variables associated to the tree topology and to which of these nodes? And this is what you see in this plot. So the first result is that yes, variance in these bioclimatic variables is tightly linked to the structure of the phylogeny, but at the same time, most of this variance is associated to deeper nodes rather than to shallower nodes. And that's what you see in these colors in the nodes of the phylogeny. So for example, I don't know, node uh, between node five and four, the common ancestor of node five and four, 
has a blue and a yellow, so that means that, that in that clade, most of the variation is explained uh, for these two bioclimatic variables. So because most of the variance was associated to deeper nodes rather than to shallower nodes, what this suggests is that most of bioclimatic variation happens among clades rather than within clades. So how does this relate to our hypothesis of niche evolution or niche conservatism? Uh, so I run again another bioclimatic, uh, another uh, phylogenetic matter test, where in this case, uh, the x-axis corresponds to bioclimatic dissimilarity and the y-axis is phylogenetic distance. The colors are the same, but in this case, there was not enough, uh, not a strong signal for, or not strong support for any of these uh, two hypotheses. So these regressions were um, not significant. So, so far, what I have shown you. So I started this analysis uh, not knowing anything about the phylogeny of Escalonia. We didn't know how species were related to each other. And I found that the structure of the phylogeny is very strongly uh, associated or can be explained in just five clades. I show early on that uh, geography seemed to have played a major role early in the history of Escalonia by um, separating lineages to distinct geographic regions where they have been diversifying in complete isolation, perhaps with the exception of that migration between the Andes and Brazil in one, in one clade. But also I show you that most of the variation in, bi in bioclimatic variables, at least for these variables of the bioclimatic niche, seem to be associated also to these deep nodes, or basically between clades or among clades rather than within clades, suggesting that with, with this separation of lineages, with geographic separation, also came along some differentiation or some evolution of the bioclimatic niche at least for these five bioclimatic variables, four bioclimatic variables. The question is, what is really going on inside the clades? So inside the clades, I found very weak signal for bioclimatic differentiation, and in some cases, I found a strong signal for uh, basically isolation by distance. So this begs the question of what's really going on inside the clades? Are the, the species limits wrong inside the clades, and what we have is actually only five species, or are the species, um, well delimited and, and we just basically need more data to basically understand what species really are to get a, an understanding of the role of geography and environment in speciation. So this takes me to the second, to the third part of the talk where I'm gonna be describing some of the work that I've been doing on species delimitations. <clears throat> so um, I just don't want to get into a big uh, uh, sort of philosophical discussion about species. I think it's uh, um, enough to say that for most of us, uh, we understand that the species are these lineages that evolve and they speciate through time and space and they become these distinct entities. And during the process of species divergence, species acquire different uh, properties. They become morphologically distinct. They can become reproductively isolated. They can become uh, monophyletic. They evolve differences in their uh, reproductive systems and so on and so forth. And we systematists, we can use those properties or those criteria as ways to assess where species stand in this process of divergence. So for this work, I focus on mainly uh, three of these uh, criteria. I focus on differences in their bioclimatic niche, differences in their morphology, and I assess uh, something about uh, the genetic relationships of populations and species. Uh, so specifically, I ask three questions. Are species in Escalonia separated from each other by morphological gaps or morphological discontinuities, as this has been the main criterion that taxonomists have been using in the past? Do species show differences in the bio bioclimatic niche and our species uh, showing signals of, of monophyly. Uh, this is a, a first pass on, on monophyly, and I know that uh, we can do much better than this, but this was an initial analysis. So to analyze um, uh, morphological variation, I collected uh, many samples, and I also supplemented these with samples from herbarium specimens from about uh, 840 uh, specimens that I collected throughout the Andes, also from different places, and I took measurements on about uh, 10 to 12 uh, continuous traits, and I focus on these traits because these have been the traits that have been used in the past to diagnose the species boundaries in Escalonia. So I measured all of these things for all these specimens, and then I faced um, one of the first challenges, which was there was not a method available at the time in the literature to ask these hypotheses or to test these hypotheses about uh, species, to, ask the to test the hypothesis that the species are separated from each other by morphological discontinuities. So um, a few years ago, I developed, uh, uh, I proposed uh, basically a method that we can use for this. Uh, this is, uh, was published in CISBio a few years ago, where basically we can model uh, variation in continuous traits using normal mixtures, which are basically mixtures of uh, species, 
you see normal, normal distributions, each normal distribution being a single species. And then we can ask if these mixtures are bimodal and if there's a gap separating these two normal distributions. Uh, the very cool aspect about this method, and I'm showing here the simplest case, but the cool thing about this method is that regardless of the number of dimensions or regardless of the number of morphological measurements that you have, as long as you are asking the question about pairs of species, this method reduces the dimensionality always to one, only to a single line. So you can have as many characters as you want, and by doing this method, you reduce all the analysis to just a single dimension, which is this red line called a rich line manifold, or it's the manifold of this mixture. Once you have reduced the, the problem to one dimension, you can basically plot the frequency of phenotypes along that manifold and assess if there is a gap or if there's continuity separating these two populations. I'm not gonna go into the details of how can you assess how deep is the gap, but I'll be happy to talk about that uh, uh, if anybody's interested. So using this approach, I decided to apply this method for testing the hypothesis of species boundaries for all the pairs of species in Escalonia. So remember that I showed already that all the clades are, all the species are restricted to geographic clades and species don't jump from clade, from clade to clade. So I decided to start analyzing um, uh, species boundaries within clades and uh, this is a, a way in which I implemented the method for uh, looking for gaps in morphology. So the first step was redu reducing the dimensionality for all these 12 or 15 uh, morphological variables into fewer dimensions that uh, allow me to have a sort of a, a better, a low, a lower number of dimensions for uh, estimating the variances and the covariances of all these uh, uh, mixtures. And then in these spaces is where I use this method of comparing all the pairs of species and I ask if a species were separated by, from each other by morphological gaps. And then I found uh, kind of another challenge on how to represent this absence of gaps or these gaps between pairs of species when you have multiple pairs of species. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately for us, uh, our predecessors from the 40s and 50s doing biosystematics and doing kind of the same questions, they had the same problem when they were crossing species and they were trying to summarize the information that you have from uh, the crossability among uh, species that are closely related. And they use these um, uh, plots called the crossing polygons, where what you have is the species in the periphery of these figures and the lines connecting the different species correspond to the different degrees of interfertility. So that corresponds to the thickness of the lines. So in the spirit of this same approach, I use crossing polygons to summarize information for pairs of species in Escalonia. So what you see here, for example, in this clade, uh, the species are in the periphery, the end corresponds to the sample size, and the lines connecting the species show cases in which there's no evidence of morphological gap separating all those pairs of species. So as you can see, some species are highly connected to each other. They have sort of in network, uh, sort of lingo, they have high uh, connectivity, or species are completely disconnected from each other, suggesting that they are very different from, from all other species. So I repeated this analysis across clades for all the species, and in summary, I found that only looking at morphological data, I have evidence of species boundaries for nine species and no evidence for 26 species. Then I uh, look at differences in bioclimatic variables, so I use the standard bioclim data from the working database, I downloaded all these um, bioclimatic variables for the same specimens, all of them were georeferenced. And to conduct this analysis, I used the standard approach that people have been using in the past of uh, reducing, again, the dimensionality uh, to estimate sort of the bioclimatic uh, space, bioclimatic occupancy with PCAs, and then I ask if a species, pairs of species were different, um, have different, um, show differences in their bioclimatic envelope in these uh, bioclimatic spaces. Again, this analysis was restricted to species within clades, I repeated this analysis across clades. I used uh, uh, MANOAs. And what I found in summary was uh, that because these were pairs of species, I also needed to summarize this information with uh, crossing polygons, where in this case, the lines connecting the different species correspond to cases where there is no differences in the bioclimatic niche. Uh, but other than that, it's the same as, as before. And I repeated this analysis across the species. And I found uh, that there is no evidence of only looking at the bioclimatic data for um, 25 species, and there is evidence supporting bioclimatic differences among species for 10 of the species. Uh, finally, I moved into uh, some genetic work, and this is some of the early analysis that we were doing. So I increased the sampling to multiple individuals per species. This is throughout the Andes, so it was a lot of work to be able to sample many individuals across the Andes. I was able to secure about 90 individuals 
Uh, and in many cases, and then I use standard phylogenetic approaches to just look at, at, at monophyly uh, as, a, as an initial pass. And in many cases, I found evidence of monophyly of species. But in many cases, I found that species were not monophyletic also across uh, these different clades. So in summary, I found evidence of uh, species boundaries for 18 species and no evidence of species boundaries for 17 species. So then the question is, okay, I have these three lines of evidence. How can I put them back together to decide what species really are in this group? So remember um, what I showed early on, that species are these uh, populations that evolve through time and they acquire different uh, differences in the process of divergence. They become uh, morphologically distinct. They evolve differences in the niches, monophyly, and so on and so forth. But all of these properties can evolve in different times and in different orders. And species don't need to have all of these properties to be recognized as a species. And that's what basically we see today. We see cryptic species, which are, to most of us, a species that don't have mor morphological differences, yet they are monophyletic or they are not, um, they are reproductively isolated. Furthermore, if we read uh, uh, De Carroll, who is the, uh, the guy who has been proposing this framework for speed limitations, he suggests that evidence from any of these criteria is sufficient to support the hypothesis of a species boundary. So how can we apply this idea of looking at evidence from any of these criteria to basically apply the general lineage concept? So remember that my results were summarized with these um, crossing polygons for the absence of gaps, the absence of more climatic differences, and the presence of, uh, presence of absence of morphological gaps. So what one needs to do is to look at the intersection of these uh, networks or these graphs, and what, what is left with are the cases that are connected for both of the two evidences. So basically cases where there is no evidence of morphology and no evidence of bioclimatic niches. For all the other species, there is evidence from one or the other one of these uh, criteria. Furthermore, we can bring the information from the genes and break some of these connections because for some of the species, we have evidence for the molecules that these species are um, distinct, uh, at least uh, using this uh, monophyletic approach. So what initially seemed to be a fairly complicated case of lack of species boundaries when looking at all these different evidences, evidences, what it seems now is that there's only a handful of species that perhaps seem more problematic uh, when we look at this type of data with just absence of species boundaries in only uh, a few of these species. So I uh, applied this method, this approach of sort of looking at the overlap of all these crossing polygons for all the species across all the clades. And this is a summary figure where you see the crossing polygons for morphology, the crossing polygons for bioclimate, and the crossing polygons for molecules, and then the overlap of all of these uh, crossing polygons. And what you are left with are the species that seem to be uh, very poorly uh, delimited. But on top of this, this approach not only allows us to uh, the limited species, but can also provide information likely about uh, speciation mechanisms. So let me walk you through a couple of examples that uh, this type of data and type of analysis uh, can give information on. So the first one is uh, the clade uh, here represented in red, the clade two, where I have a pair of species that are morphologically quite similar, and they seem to share very uh, a lot of similarities in their bioclimatic niche. However, these species are um, uh, strictly monophyletic and I don't have here, but these species are also allopatric. So this suggests a case of allopatric species, likely allopatric speciation with niche conservatism, reflected in the sh shared similarities in bioclimatic niche space, but also uh, uh, absence of morphological gaps. The second case is the case of the clade in green, where we have a set of six species that are um, um, uh, parapatric. All, all of them are in the same uh, uh, mountain range, and they replace each other along elevation and gradients. So what you see here is a case where some of the species seem to be morphologically quite similar. However, they have evolved enough morphological bioclimatic differences along this elevation replacement. Furthermore, some of them seem to show strong signals of monophyly, suggesting that in this case, likely uh, what we are seeing is a case of parapatric speciation, likely induced by this bioclimatic uh, evolution, evolution to these different bioclimatic conditions, so induced by this uh, uh, evolution to um, driven by environmental uh, pressures. The last case that I want to highlight here is uh, this purple clade, so there are many things going on here, but I just want to highlight one uh, species, which is this is species in the in circle in black. What I'm showing here is that, as you can see, this species is morphologically quite similar to many species in that phylogeny or in that clade, however, is 
are morphologically distinct to the only two species with which it shares the bioclimatic space. So basically, this species, when it shares bioclimatic space with other species, they seem to have sort of evolved enough morphological differences, suggesting that perhaps these ecological pressures play an important role in sort of separating and driving differences in, uh, in, in, in how plants basically adapt to the different ecological conditions. So there are many cases like this one and many more, and we can walk through all, this, all the possible clades to sort of uh, uh, see what is going on. But uh, in a matter of time, I'm just gonna jump to uh, some summary results of this analysis of species boundaries. So what I show is that initially I asked the question, is there a problem with species limitations? Are only five species of Escalonia or are there the 39 that we started with? Uh, so far, we seem to find support for 20 uh, of species. So 70% of the species seem to have uh, support from the different types of data. Some species are uh, either morphologically distinct, some species are molecularly distinct, some are bioclimatically distinct, some of them have all of them, some of them have combinations of all these traits, and this is basically what we expect, because that, this is what we have seen in nature uh, in all groups, that species have evolved in different dimensions and in different axes at different times and in different um, properties. Then the question is, what is really going on with the species that there's no species boundaries? So remember that uh, all of these are basically tests, like a, a test of a statistical inference. And in a statistical inference, absence of evidence is not necessarily uh, evidence of absence. So it could be that maybe species boundaries exist there, but I wasn't able to find them. Perhaps I didn't measure uh, more refined characters that perhaps are driving the species differences, and that could be refined through more morphological measurements. It could be the bioclimatic differences are not um, uh, so broad to be explained by these global bioclimatic variables. And some of my observations in the field suggest that some species are very uh, unique in their microhabitats. Some of them are adapted to different soil types. So perhaps there's some other some axis that I wasn't able to capture with these broad bioclimatic variables. And of course, uh, the lack of a species monophyly could be a lot of interspecific gene flow that perhaps doesn't necessarily break the morphological distinctions of a species. And also we are seeing this now that we see genomes uh, sequence for many plants and animals, but also could be a case of incomplete lineage sorting where uh, the recent um, radiation of these plants has been uh, sort of driving um, the lack of monophyly. So we're trying to test uh, some of these ideas and some of these hypotheses uh, right now. Before I move on to show a little bit of what we're doing, let me uh, sort of summarize the big picture of all what we uh, I show you already. So. In the first part of the talk, I show you that uh, for the whole genus, what we find is that geography seemed to be an important uh, early factor driving the isolation of, of lineages to geographic regions. Then within geographic regions, lineages seem to diversify across these elevational gradients. Some of the geographic isolation was associated perhaps to some evolution of the bioclimatic niche, but remember that climate and, and, geographic and geography are correlated, so this is a difficult thing to disentangle. But this is a pattern that has, has started to come up repeatedly in many clades of plants, uh, in also in the Andes, such as the Alstroberiaceae, but in other hotspots that also show elevation ranges, such as in New Caledonia, in the uh, family Ebenaceae. <coughs> uh, in the second part, I move into this diversifications within clades, and with my analysis of species limitations, looking for signals of uh, uh, speciation, I show that in some clades, there is likely allopatric speciation, in one case with uh, niche evolution, in our case with niche conservatism, but the bulk of the species, some of those clades only have two species, but the bulk of the species, basically all their main clades, show signals to suggest that parapatric speciation, likely induced by these environmental gradients, is one of the main factors driving the evolution of a species. Of course, the question is, what is the mechanism driving this uh, parapatric speciation? What is the role of natural selection versus genetic drift in the process of diversification? How porous are the gene, uh, bound, the species boundaries that allow genes to move across the species boundaries and perhaps foster the colonization of some of these other uh, species across environmental gradients? So those are some of the questions that we are uh, trying to ask right now. Another question that we are trying to ask right now is that if you see all this analysis that I presented so far, basically test the hypothesis of species boundaries or the species that we have today, but they don't ask if those species to start with are really distinct entities. I basically assume that those were the entities, and then I use them as my, my, my groups to test hypotheses about differences in groups, differences in bioclimate, and so on and so forth. And of course, as you saw, the taxon sampling and the molecular sampling is a little bit limited. 
So what we have been doing uh, uh, more recently is move into uh, more genomic approaches to um, uh, ask these ideas, these hypotheses about species delimitations within clades. And again, this is work led by Sarah, my postdoc, where we are now using, again, DDRAT-seq uh, within clades to test this, uh, this hypothesis. This is a, an initial analysis that we were doing a couple of weeks ago using this approach proposed by uh, Hosdorf and Hennig, where you use basically SNP data and use um, uh, uh, multivariate techniques to um, uh, basically assign individuals to the different uh, species and you basically ask this analysis without knowing how many groups, you don't know how many groups you have, and basically you let the data uh, explain, uh, provide you the, the number of different groups that you have in, in, in your sample. So we did this analysis for one of the clades, we had uh, about 50 or 60 individuals, about 2,000 SNPs, and uh, at the, the bottom you see that this analysis we provided, they have six species names, they are named as six different species currently, they have the, the hypothesis that there are six different groups, but now in the colors we see that they correspond likely to only uh, three uh, different species. So suggesting that likely um, some of the current hypothesis species don't correspond to these uh, um, species that you can delimit using only molecular data. In addition to this, we have been using the same type of approaches of asking how many groups you have in your, in your data with morphology. So before I used my, my, the other method that I proposed of comparing groups of species, uh, assigning the species, the specimens to species a priori. So now we don't assign the groups to species a priori and we ask how many groups we have in these mixtures. Again, this is using mixture models and uh, we fit different number of, of of mixtures or different uh, number of components of these mixtures and we ask which of these models is best supported. Uh, um, a couple of, la last year I presented a similar analysis using the Darwin Finches. My colleague Daniel Cadena, who was here actually last week, was the uh, lead author on, on that paper. But the idea here is that you use morphological measurements to ask how many groups you have independent of the, assign the assignment of specimens a priori. These are uh, specimens of the same clade and we have now more individuals. I was able to measure more than, than the gene sampling, only using 10 traits as a, as a run test. And these analyses were led by my undergrad, uh, Rudy Diaz. And we see that in this case, the best model is, a case, is, is the uh, um, case that supports four groups, suggesting that here, molecules and morphology are telling us very different things. In one case, we, saw, we have only three species molecules. Morphologically, we have four species. But the main goal that we are trying to go with this is that most people uh, and most of the methods uh, in the last few years for species limitations have been largely driven by trusting the molecules so much that uh, the morphology hasn't been sort of used in a more explicit and quantitative way and is not way with the same sort of equal footing to molecules and that in our, in, in, in our view what this is uh, not allowing us to basically discover all the types of species that exist in nature. So we have been uh, trying to develop uh, new methods and new approaches to weigh morphology and molecules in similar ways that allow us to basically identify the different types of species. So more species where molecules and morphology coincide is what people have been calling good species or species where the molecules tell us that they are different but morphologically there's no and with, with a solid statistical analysis of morphology, these are cryptic species. And the other category is the category that we plant systematists have known for for more than 50 or 60 years where the morphology is telling us what species are and the molecules are just missing the species boundaries perhaps because what we have is that there's some gene flow perhaps across species boundaries but the species still maintain their morphological differences. So this approach to species limitations is gonna allow us to perhaps discover in a very solid statistic, statistical way the different types of species that can illuminate potentially what's going on in speciation. Some cases could be speciation with gene flow, some cases could be full allopatric speciation, and so on and so forth. Uh, more recently, we have been working with Joseph Uera from uh, Virginia Tech and his lab, where we are also trying to incorporate phylogenetic information in these normal mixtures to understand what is the topography. So the topography of normal mixtures with morphology and understanding what is the phylogenetic structure underlying these normal mixtures to basically co-inform what the molecules can tell the, the morphology and the morphology can tell the molecules to basically separate species by using two lines of evidence in the same sort of solid uh, framework. Uh, I have maybe a couple of minutes. So the last thing that I want to present is that, okay, so all of this is very uh, 
interesting about the speech limitation, understanding what species are, but we systematists have been, um, as uh, uh, Stephen mentioned, interested in, in sort of communicating this knowledge about what we do as systematists. So this goes back to uh, what uh, Stephen mentioned as my classic training as in classic systematics. And one of the things that we systematists uh, used to write were monographs. So monographs, for those of you who haven't read a monograph or who read a monograph and haven't read it again, are these um, basically thick books where we sort of write down all what we know about species, the species limitations, morphological variation, all of these things. And these books end up usually in libraries, stock forever, and nobody reads them again. And it's pretty unfortunate because this is all the work that we systematists have been doing in trying to describe a species diversity and all, all of our hypotheses of what species really are. So recently I got funding uh, from NSF to try to uh, think about ways in which we can uh, make monographs more exciting and more dynamic. So he, here's a uh, simple example uh, where I'm uh, presenting a monograph as a shiny app. For those of you who are familiar with R, shiny app is basically R code in the background, uh, rendering text and rendering analysis. But all what is really going on is there is R code that is querying a database of information about this species, measurements, number of specimens, so on and so forth. So anytime that I add a new specimen, some of my numbers here, for example, I have here 129 specimens. So if I add one number to my database, this monograph automatically is gonna show that I have more specimens. But on top of that, we can start doing uh, very interesting things. So we can start connecting uh, the geographic distribution of specimens. So this is a map where we can sort of uh, start looking at, for example, here, this is one of these specimens. So if I click on this specimen, specimen uh, FC240, so if I go here, for example, to the tropical database in the Missouri Botanical Garden, it's connected to the specimen. So I have all the information about the geography. Uh, Missouri is taking pictures of all these specimens. So there's gonna be a picture of this specimen of, the, of this actual uh, collection. You can get to all the nomenclature, all the nom nomenclatural history, connect back to the taxonomy of these things. Um, but you can also do other things such as, for example, present and describe the patterns of variation uh, in a very sort of dynamic and, and intuitive ways. For example, here they have a plot where we have basically longitude and lati land latitude, and the points here correspond to the different species, and the size of the points, points correspond to uh, leaf length. But we can change this to, I don't know, like calyx length, so all the dots can be regenerated, but we can also start exploring the different species, so we can sort of, I don't know, turn off some of these species, turn off some of these species, and this allows us to get a better understanding of what we as systematists have been doing to basically interpret morphological variation, uh, and this is, not only for systematists, but for anybody who's interested in these plants, can just go back and sort of understand what we have been doing. At the same time, we can sort of plot uh, patterns of variation in different traits. So again, what is going on behind the scenes is that R is basically regenerating these plots every time that we change to any of these uh, axes, and you can do it with different types of traits. Um, you can also plot phenological traits, so it's basically querying this database of specimens and asking, uh, uh, what is the phenology, you can uh, download the, the chart, you can download the data that is behind this, all the flowering time and so on and so forth. Of course, there's uh, the phylogeny. I didn't have time to link all the specimens to the plots on top, but each of these specimens have morphological measurements, so you're gonna be able to sort of link and click each of these specimens, and it's gonna show you where they fall in this morphological space, so you can sort of see how morphology and molecules are connected. And um, of course, part of monographs is species delimitations. So here's another example that we have been uh, sort of running the lab using SNP data. Uh, typical kind of analysis where people use structure type of analysis or a mixture type of analysis where we can ask how many, do we have two species or three species? So basically in the background, uh, we can regenerate and rerun all these analysis and be super clear and explicit about what species really are in all these measurements and all these analyses and the same for morphology. So this is the plot that I show you with only vegetative traits, only reproductive traits, with both traits. Uh, you can summarize the results. And again, all these data, it's, it's out there available and anybody can sort of repeat the analysis. If people don't trust these species limitations, you can go back to this analysis. And of course, as more specimens are measured, some of these analyses are gonna be uh, regenerating on their own. Of course, these descriptions can have many things. You can link to the NCBI taxonomy. You can, you can link to pictures of the types in different herbaria. This is in the field museum and so on and so forth. 
and perhaps one of the things that I'm most excited about is that uh, I think that we should be uh, uh, providing all these raw data available. So that you can download all these morphological measurements because not only systemic things are interested in, in speed limitations or taxonomy, but ecologists or any or anybody else can download this data, repeat it, do all, all sorts of analysis. And I just want to finish by thanking many people, my research group in UCLA, my friends and collaborators, Daniel and Yuan, uh, many herbaria. I am, a, as you can tell, I'm a plant systematist rooted in a herbarium, uh, my NSF funding and different uh, funding sources. Thanks so much. Yes. Yeah, I think that that's a really, uh, so for those who maybe who didn't hear the question is, how do we know if those phenotypes uh, evolve, if they are easily evolved so that you can have convergence really easily, or if not, and then you have really distinct species, how basically how, morph how morphology evolves? Mm, I think that that's kind of the, the, uh, the question that all of us are trying to answer. Um, I think that we know very little about evolution of phenotypes, and we have some models that we can use for modeling the evolution of phenotypes. Mainly, uh, I, may, I don't know if you're familiar, but some of the basic models assume Brownian motion, that, that it's basically this random walk where you sort of expect that these phenotypes evolve uh, in this random fashion, and then you can sort of include all parameters for selection, and you can have different things. But to be honest, I, I think that all of us agree that that's a very crude understanding of how phenotypes evolve. So we don't really know how phenotypes in general evolve for many of these uh, groups. And the assumption that I'm making here is, so the initial analysis don't assume anything about the evolution of the traits, it's just finding groups. Now with the new methods that we're trying to develop where we combine morphology and molecules, we are now trying to model the evolution of continuous traits using these initial analysis, these simple models of Brownian motion, but they can be easily modified to include different parameters. But to be honest, we, I don't think that anybody can tell you for sure how morphology evolves. I think that that's a really difficult uh, pattern to, to describe. Yeah, so I think that that's, that's kind of a, a, a valid question. Like, how, what do you call the groups that the, at the end you, you end up with? If they are distinct morphologically, ecologically, you do, should you call them species or ecotypes or anything? Uh, I would call them species because all these lines of evidence are in theory, based, I mean, if you, if you sort of read biological theory, all of these properties evolve only when you have really distinct species. So usually in ecotypes, you might find differentiation in the phenotype, but very unlikely to have uh, gaps separating morphology if you put these sort of ecotypes in sympatry. So if these ecotypes in sympatry, if they're the same species, they shouldn't show morphological differences. So some of the stuff that I didn't show is that some of this analysis, the under, underline of this analysis are also sort of geographic information about where these specimens grow. So if species are in sympatry and you find differences in the phenotype, differences in the genes and differences in ecology, or they show some signal of, of geographic overlap, it's very hard to not call them a species because biological theory predicts that in those conditions, the only way that you, can ex that you can have distinct morphological entities, distinct biological entities, distinct reproductively isolated entities and everything is if they are basically distinct species. It's very hard to call them populations if, if, if in sympathy they, they don't have any of those, those signals. So I think that the geography also plays a key, a key role in this analysis that I didn't emphasize a lot, but yeah. Did you get to see the biodiversity loss from the plants? Oh my God, that would be amazing. <laughs> Some of these plants, I mean, most of these are trees in the Andes and finding them was hard enough. So 
my dream would be to have a common garden where I have all the plants and I can do crosses and stuff like that, but that would take me, I don't know, my career and somebody else's because that's, to cross, to cross trees would be hard, <laughs> but yeah. No, no, and that's something that actually my last semester proposal that was rejected was trying to address that is sort of the temporal axis that I don't have here very explicitly and thinking about sort of the speciation continuum and how species basically accumulate differences and try to estimate rates of morphological or ecological differentiations across this sort of speciation continuum. But um, if I get funding at some point, I might, I might be able to start working this, but yeah. I think it's I think it's relatively short period of time. I mean, most of these species, at least, are and most of the examples that I'm finding repeatedly are in relatively young radiations. So you see these signals. I mean, the Andes are relatively young species. New Caledonia, some of the species are relatively young in the mountains. So it seems that it's possible, or at least it's likely, that these differences accumulate uh, really rapidly. Um, but I, I cannot say for sure. Like they they number of years, but I, I believe that it could be fairly fast. Yes? Great talk. I, I really like this theory of updating knowledge about the species and things like that. But when we're talking about the morphology, I, I, have not, I if I understood you correctly, we're dealing explicitly with quantitative traits, is that right? Yeah, so what I, what I show here were quantitative traits. I also use some qualitative traits. Uh, there is also a, a way to sort of assess if there are gaps in the frequency of zeros and ones or ones and twos. Mm -hmm. And some of those approaches, I didn't show them here, but they are pretty much, in co I mean, some species are a little bit different, but for the most part, they support uh, the same morphological species. But you can use the same approaches with, with qualitative traits, basically zeros and ones or binary traits, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.